Welcome to this special event to honour Constitution Day. I'm Keith Webster, the Helen and Henry Posner Jr. Dean of University Libraries at Carnegie Mellon University. And I am so pleased that you are able to join us for this year's Constitution Day Lecture. This event is a joint venture between the University Libraries and our friends in the Division of Student Affairs and the Alumni Association. We deeply value this partnership through which we have brought Constitution Day events to you since 2005. This year I'd like to acknowledge and thank Anne Kramer, my Executive Assistant, for coordinating this event, Shannon Riff, our Associate Dean for External Relations, and her entire team. Later in this event you'll meet two other colleagues, Lenny Chan, the Associate Dean of Student Affairs and Director of the Office of Community Standards and Integrity. Lenny will moderate a Q&A session after today's lecture. And closing remarks will be delivered by my colleague Gina Casalenu, Vice President for Student Affairs and Dean of Students. One special feature of our Constitution Day celebrations at Carnegie Mellon is the recognition of the copy of the Bill of Rights held in the Posner Centre. This is one of only four surviving copies of the first printing of the US Bill of Rights and its ratifications, and it is part of the Posner Memorial Collection. We're grateful to the Posner Foundation and the Posner family for entrusting Carnegie Mellon University Libraries with the care and stewardship of this magnificent collection. To say more about our copy of the Bill of Rights, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Sam Lemley, Curator of Special Collections in the University Libraries. Sam is responsible for our collections of rare books, manuscripts, and early scientific instruments and calculating machines. Sam might be best known to many of you as the host of Coffee with the Curator, an ongoing series of informative YouTube videos on distinctive objects held in special collections. And you can find those videos on our YouTube channel. With that, Sam, welcome. The floor is yours. Good evening, everyone. I'm Sam Lemley. I'm the Curator of Special Collections at Carnegie Mellon University Libraries, and tonight I'll be sharing something from the collection with you in introduction to tonight's event. So this is, I think, uh, one of the most remarkable things in Special Collections at CMU. It's a printed pamphlet. It's about 11 inches tall, and at some point in the past it was actually removed from its original binding. And you can see that there are some small uh, fragments of that original binding spine on the pamphlet's left-hand edge. Uh, you can also see that there's a small stain in the upper right portion of the first page and the outer leaves, right, the first and last pages that kind of serve as the pamphlet's binding in the absence of um, the original binding uh, are noticeably darker and kind of stained. And that suggests that it's actually been in this disbound condition for some time uh, and was probably handled in this condition for you know the centuries um, that it was in circulation before coming to CMU. So uh, on the first page of the document, about a third of the way down, uh, is the article or the uh, document's title, and that's articles in addition to an amendment of uh, the Constitution of the United States of America. Um, of course, this is a copy of the American Bill of Rights. Um, it was printed in Philadelphia by special commission in January or February 1792. And this particular copy was purchased by Henry Posner Sr. in 1963 and was later deposited um, with the libraries along with the rest of the Posner Memorial Collection uh, by Henry Posner's son and family. So given the appearance of this document, it usually surprises visitors to special collections uh, to learn that this is one of the rarest documentary artifacts that we have. Um, and in fact, it actually might be the rarest uh, single item we hold. Uh, only five copies, including this one, are known to survive. So that's, that's a vanishingly small survival rate um, given the size of the original edition, uh, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, but you know, apart from its rarity, uh, what's fascinating about this document is that this printing uh, of the Bill of Rights 
uh, it wasn't fully unprecedented, right? This was not the first time uh, that the constitutional amendments that would become the Bill of Rights uh, had been printed. In fact, they had been put into circulation fairly early, uh, usually in the form of newspapers or broadsides, um, you know, as early as 1789, uh, which was immediately after uh, they were approved by Congress uh, and sent to the states for debate uh, for ratification. Um, so what does make, or uh, what, what did make this uh, particular printing of the Bill of Rights important and groundbreaking, uh, then, is the context of its printing. Uh, and remember that it was printed likely in January or February 1792, in other words, immediately after Virginia became the 11th and final state to ratify on December 15th, um, 1791. Um, and it was Virginia's vote that met the requirement that uh, three-fourths of states ratify any proposed amendment to the Constitution. Uh, and remember, too, at this point in American history, there were only 14 states, and the Constitution itself was fewer than five years old. Um, so this document that I'm holding, um, you know, putting it differently, is uh, it's the first form of the Bill of Rights that could claim the force of law and the first time that its 10 uh, articles appeared in print as an integral part of the United States Constitution. Uh, and for this reason, constitutional scholars uh, and scholars of American history uh, refer to this document, this printing, as the official, the first official Bill of Rights. Um, so instead of merely listing the ratified amendments, though, it also records the kind of legal deliberation and legislative compromise that led to ratification. So, you know, in a sense, uh, embedded in this document is the story of the contentious origin uh, of the American Bill of Rights. And I think the best and most basic evidence for this is the fact that it lists 12 uh, amendments rather than the more familiar 10. Uh, what many don't know is that of the 12 amendments that were originally proposed in 1789, uh, only amendments 3 through 12 were ratified to become part of the Constitution. So, you know, for example, our First Amendment, which protects uh, the freedoms of speech, uh, religion, assembly, and the press, was actually the third, right, in the original form of those 12 uh, articles. So, um, besides that, though, beneath the printed amendments, uh, beginning on page 3, appears a kind of roll call of states, um, recording how each state voted on the question of ratification. Um, and I find this fascinating because it turns out that the bulk of the Posner Bill of Rights, you know, actually isn't the Bill of Rights at all. Um, you know, the amendments take up only one leaf or two pages out of 12. Um, you know, but otherwise most of the document is given over to kind of an enumerative record of legislative bureaucracy. Um, so I'm going to show Pennsylvania's vote on screen here, which appears on page 9. And Pennsylvania was one of the last states to submit its vote on ratification. Uh, and you can see that that uh, vote is dated September 21st, 1791, or about three months before Virginia's deciding vote. So after Virginia's vote to ratify was submitted to the federal government, Thomas Jefferson, who was then Secretary of State, commissioned the printing of this edition, um, and 135 copies were made and distributed to the 14 state legislatures um, to ensure that they had ha uh, the sort of official and approved language of the amendments on file. Um, so that's that's a very almost painfully brief documentary history of the Bill of Rights that only brings us to about 1792, 1793. Uh, but I want to end with the observation, um, or, or sort of by looking forward, right, with the observation that this copy of the Bill of Rights offers a number of important lessons, uh, most of which are still very much alive today. You know, famously, Thomas Jefferson called the Constitution uh, a good canvas in need of some retouching. Uh, and I think revisiting this document reminds us that the American experiment is uh, maybe always a good canvas in need of some retouching. You know, and that's that's 
part of its power and part of its beauty. Um, you know, after all, this particular copy of the Posner or the Posner Bill of Rights um, you know, lacks all the so-called Reconstruction Amendments, including the Thirteenth Amendment, which effectively ended slavery in the United States, uh, and the Fourteenth and Fifteenth Amendments, which respectively extended uh, the rights of citizenship and the right to vote to recently emancipated enslaved people. Um, so, you know, with that idea. Uh, kind of offered in introduction, I would invite all of you, anyone, to reach out uh, to me with questions about special collections or the Posner Bill of Rights. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sam, for an informative presentation. It's now my pleasure to introduce this year's Constitution Day lecturer, Dr. Ignacio Arana, an assistant professor at Carnegie Mellon's Institute of Security and Technology. Ignacio is a comparativist who specializes in elite behavior by analyzing how the personality traits and other individual differences of heads of government impact executive governments. He studies the consequences of variation in political institutions across countries, with an emphasis on Latin America, examining executive legislative relations, informal institutions, gender and politics, and judicial politics. He has recently completed a book manuscript titled Presidential Personalities and Constitutional Power Grabs in Latin America, 1945 to 2021, and that is the title also for this evening's lecture. Ignacio will draw on years of studying presidential behavior to examine the characteristics of leaders who undermine their country's democracies through constitutional power grabs. This lecture will discuss the individual characteristics of presidents who attempt to change the constitutions of their country to relax their term limits or increase their powers. Ignacio, welcome. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much for that introduction, Dean Keith. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, it is my honor to present uh, to you today the core of a book I just uh, completed. Uh, before sharing with you my presentation, I would like to uh, provide some historical context. All Latin American countries except Cuba are presidential systems, and they are presidential systems because they uh, borrow heavily from the American Constitution. Um, like the United States, all Latin American countries um, overthrew, uh, gained independence from monarchies, and the elites needed to create a new political system. So uh, national elites uh, um, uh, borrow heavily from the American Constitution because all uh, countries became independent between 1808 and 1826. So a few decades after the American independence. The only exception is Cuba, which became independent in 1898. So national elites uh, used the American constitution as a reference. And over time, constitutions were amended or replaced to adapt them, adapt them to the national uh, realities. So there's a strong influence of the American constitution on Latin American constitutionalism. Now, let me share with you my presentation. It's the title of the book is Presidential Personalities and Constitutional Power Grabs in Latin America from 1945 to 2021. The motivation is to study how the individual differences of presence are, can be associated with relevant political outcomes. What do I mean by individual differences? Differential psychology defines individual differences as how individuals are different from each other. In other words, how we are different in terms of personality, abilities, and experience. The individual differences are strong predictors of job performance and job satisfaction. Uh, according to one author, a two thirds of medium to large American organizations use some type of psychological testing 
to select personnel. And they do this to uh, improve fit and reduce turnover. So we know, for example, that optimist salespeople tend to sell more. They sell more cars, they sell more shoes, they uh, sell more properties. But what about presidents, who are the most powerful politician in presidential systems? We don't have similar data for presidents. Um, we know a lot about presidents. Uh, most citizens have strong opinions about them. Um, the media covers their daily agenda. Um, uh, pundits write uh, about them uh, frequently in the media. There are books and biographies written about them. So we have a lot of information about presidents. However, most of mainstream quantitative political science research that analyzes the presidency treats the individual differences among leaders as residual variants. So the assumption here is that the individual differences of these individuals are dispensable in the explanation of their actions. Um, this assumption is really untenable because we know that they reached the presidency based on their personal trajectory and based on who they are. When we vote, we vote for a specific individual with a specific characteristics. Um, so with this motivation, um, I decided to uh, interview former presidents uh, from Latin American countries. I interviewed, I conducted 24 semi-structured interviews with former presidents in um, nine countries. Um, so in this group, uh, there are mostly uh, democratic presidents the, but there, there's also, for example, a military dictator who has was accused of a genocide uh, in Guatemala. There's a former uh, Nobel Prize winner. There are puppet presidents. There's only one woman president. I have tried to interview more. Um, there is a president who was impeached. There's another president who was ousted through a coup. So it's a, 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 a varied a group. And I asked these uh, pr former presidents uh, several questions, uh, mostly about the relationship with the constitution, but also about their own individual differences and whether they think that the individual differences of presidents uh, can be associated with, um, with their performance in office. Um, guess what? Their overwhelming reply was yes, absolutely yes. For them, it was very obvious that uh, who the president is makes a, a, a big difference. So these are the other presidents. Um, so uh, building on these semi-structured interviews and on differential psychology research, uh, I studied presidents addressing two extremely important research questions. So the first research question is which presidents challenge their term limits? So these are presidents who try to change the constitution to relax their term limits so they can govern for more time. This is a global trend. 30% of the 221 presidents from Latin America, the Middle East, Africa, and Asia who faced the end of their terms from 1975 to 2018, attempted to extend their stay in office. Uh, there are influential countries in this group, such as Russia, Egypt, China, and Brazil. Uh, so with Vladimir Putin from Russia, uh, Xi Jinping from China, El Sisi uh, in Egypt, and Fernando Enrique Cardoso in Brazil. Um, 35 Latin American presidents who governed from 1945 to 2021 tried 49 times to overstay in office. Um, this is more, a little bit more than 10% of uh, the presidents that governed in this period. And these presidents expand their capacity when they succeed in uh, to maintain promises and to enforce threats in intertemporal negotiations, make more appointments to state positions, they develop a clientelist relations and they enjoy the material and symbolic privileges of the position for longer. The expanded incumbency advantages of these presidents dampen political competition, reinforcing the leader's attachment to their offices. Um, the second research question is uh, which presidents in increase their formal powers? 
Um, so in the comparative politics literature, there are lists of what are the formal powers of presidents, and we can talk more about that in the Q&A, uh, but it's a pretty well established and studied list. In Latin America, 26 leaders who were born between 1945 and 2021 tried 29 times to expand their powers. So this is roughly 9% of the leaders uh, that governed in this period. These presidents removed checks on their office, minimized the representativeness of the political opposition, increase their control of their cabinets, consolidate their party's leadership, and achieve more policy goals. The leeway that strong presidents enjoy comes at the expense of policy stability, electoral representation, and checks and balances. So the significance of these constitutional power graphs are first that they are, for the reasons I just mentioned, anti-democratic, and I will show you precisely how uh, the index indices of democracy decline in a, when overreaching presidents are in power. Um, this, uh, I will show you also in the next slide, the list of the heads of government who are in the group of overreaching presidents. And these are some of the most influential Latin American presidents that have governed in the region since 1945. Previous studies have not considered the individual differences of presidents as explanatory factors. I will show you that mostly the explanations are centered on institutions and the broader socioeconomic context. So this is the list of presidents. And you can see here, uh, if you are familiar with Latin America, you will see here several of the most influential presidents that have governed in the region. Uh, uh, Getulio Vargas in Brazil, Evo Morales in Bolivia, eh, eh, Juan Domingo Perón in Argentina, Daniel Ortega in Nicaragua, Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, and et cetera, et cetera. These have been all very influential presidents. Now, there are four types of explanations that the literature has provided to explain the relaxation of term limits. One is centered on executive legislative relations. I put in parentheses the authors that endorse these uh, approaches, these explanations. A second uh, explanation focuses on the president's institutional and political strength. A third one centers on the president's capacity to curb the judiciary. And a fourth one focuses on the president's material incentives. Um, Based on the interviews uh, and, and my research on differential psychology, I propose a two hypotheses about which presidents are more likely to challenge their term limits. And I propose that presidents with higher levels of dominance and that are more politically inexperienced are more likely to attempt this power graph. Why? Well, um, politically inexperienced presidents um, have a shallow understanding of the presidency. They have a shallow understanding of the pace, the procedures, and the practices of government. So they tend to overestimate uh, their capacity to relax the term limits to retain power. Um, they also are uh, face fewer constraints by elite networks. They, they, um, since they just entered the electoral arena, they don't have, they have not um, um, acquired uh, long-term commitments with other politicians. If you think about the uh, experienced politicians, they have developed a strong uh, commitments with their parties and with other politicians. So when they are in the presidency, uh, they need to return several of the favors and those commitments made throughout their careers. Now, um, uh, dominant individuals uh, tend to uh, have a, a strong motivation to outdo others. They uh, in, in have no problems in challenging and criticizing others. They enjoy controlling their context and they have a strong uh, um, inclination to impose their will on others. So these are excellent attributes that help present who wants to challenge their term limits because they allow them to endure the, endure the uh, backlash that their constitutional uh, power graph uh, will um, uh, onset. Um, they also uh, have the capacity to persuade others, especially other politicians, meaning 
legislators, and they also should have a strong motivation to retain office. There are two main types of uh, explanations that the literature has provided for the uh, increases in presidential powers. One centers on the institutional distribution of political power among branches of government, and the other one centers on socioeconomic factors such as a GDP per capita, uh, inflation, uh, economic growth, uh, level of democracy, etc. I propose uh, two hypotheses to explain uh, uh, which presidents are more likely to try to increase their powers. And those are presidents with higher levels of risk taking and presidents with higher levels of assertiveness. Pre uh, risk taking um, um, entails uh, uncertainties in the, the outcome. Uh, sought, uh, but also with potential gains. Uh, that's exactly the, what happens um, in the context of presidents who want to increase their powers. They face enormous uncertainties. If they fail, they can lose a significant amount of political capital, and they can also um, even um, lose office as it happened to an Uruguayan president. So I'm saying our certainties are high, but the potential gains are also high because increasing their powers allow presidents to consolidate their power. Um, with uh, respect to assertiveness, well, presidents who try to increase their powers should be highly motivated to succeed. Um, they uh, should have excellent negotiation skills and they should also enjoy concentration, concentrating decision-making on themselves. These are all characteristics of assertive individuals. So this is the summary of the arguments. You can see at the top, the conventional arguments. My uh, theory is at the bottom. Um, my theory uh, to explain the relaxation of term limits and the expansion of presidential powers. So <clears throat> the sample. The sample are the 332 presidents who governed one of the 19 Latin American countries from 1945 to 2021 for at least six months, six months because that gives them enough time to try a constitutional power grab. And the data comes from the presidential database of the Americas that I have built over time. Uh, it has three sources. One are the interviews that I already mentioned. Um, a second source are uh, uh, with research assistants. We coded 13 characteristics of presidents that studies have shown to be correlated with constructs of theoretical interest. We did this uh, based on the biographies of presidents. And the main component are, is the online surveys, uh, which were conducted in 2011 and 2012, and a second wave in 2021 and 2022. So, this was, uh, I could talk a lot about this, but it took a lot of time to do this. Uh, we ended up contacting 1,800 experts, uh, of which 600 produced 900, 903 evaluations of 228 of the 347 presidents who ruled in Latin America and the US between 1945 and 2021. So I also include American presidents in my uh, survey. So the expert survey, um, a, 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 the, a, I'm very satisfied with the experts that we got. 87% of the expert had graduate studies, 64% had a PhD, so highly educated experts. 42% of the participants interacted with the presidents and 8% of them interacted with the presidents more than 21 times. So we were able to reach out to advisors or other politicians, uh, ministers, former legislators, uh, or scholars who interacted frequently with presidents. So they have, they have a detailed knowledge about the individuals. Um, the experts come from 30, 33 professions. Most of uh, the largest minority in this group are political scientists, followed by historians. You can see in the map here, this map, uh, the circles show you uh, the um, IP address of the computers 
from where the experts completed the survey. So we have that data uh, and, and, and you can see most of the uh, surveys were answered in the Americas, but also we received uh, answers from um, um, uh, Europe, Asia, Oceania, and Africa. Now, you might wonder whether, well, aren't all presidents or aren't most presidents dominant, politically experienced, assertive and risk-taking, this data shows you that no. There's, they vary significantly on the, um, in, in, across all these four variables. You can see in the figure on the left, it, it shows you political experience and dominance. The triangles it shows you the presidents who were overreachers. So you can see that, yes, presidents tend to be more dominant than not and more assertive than not, um, they also tend to be more politically experienced than not, but there's variation and there is variation also in, if you focus on the red triangle, so overreaching, overreaching presence uh, were both dominant and non-dominant, assertive and unassertive, and a varied too in levels of risk-taking and political experience. So I conducted uh, um, several a statistical analysis. I conducted a discrete a time survival analysis, mostly, but not only, in which the unit of analysis uh, is precedent year. I will show you these tables, but I will not discuss these tables. We, I think I don't think we have enough time, but this provides the technical support for my findings. I conducted for each of these two dependent variables approximately, or I present approximately 30 models in which I use different samples, I measure the variables in different ways, I use different statistical techniques, etc. And the results are uh, quite robust. So these are the this is the main table about attempts to relax term limits. This is the main table that shows you the attempts to increase presidential powers. Um, but this, I do want to uh, uh, spend some time explaining you these results. So these rock plots uh, for term limits on the left, you can see that the blue curve um, presents the predicted capacity of conventional arguments. So the, there's, a a, 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 there's a probability of 72% that, that conventional arg arguments will correctly predict a constitutional power graph in, in, instead of uh, classifying it as a non-power graph. Uh, and this probability increases to 81% when you add the individual characteristics of presence. When you focus on the figure on the right, you can see that uh, the predicted, capa predicted capacity of conventional arguments is a 77%, but this increases to 85% when you add the individual differences. Now, when we... <clears throat> calculate the predicted probabilities of the presidential attempts uh, in, to relax their term limits, you can see with that when presidents are <clears throat> uh, uh, very low levels of dominance, are, are uh, highly politically experienced, they are very unlikely to try to relax their term limits. But this prob probability increases over time, or uh, increases when dominance and political inexperience increases. So you can see, for example, in dominance, uh, the most dominant president in the sample is uh, was Fidel Castro, 4.8%. So when you have that level of dominance, the probability that a president will try to relax his or her term limits is um, 10%. Um, when uh, the president is highly politically inexperienced, the probability that that president will try to uh, relax his or her term limits increases to 9%. So there's a significant effect of these two variables on the probability that presidents will attempt a constitutional power graph. Now, if uh, here I present to you the predicted probabilities of presidential uh, attempts to increase the presidential powers. So uh, similarly, when a president has, uh, is very risk averse or is very unassertive, the probability uh, that they will attempt to increase their powers is less than 1%. Uh, 
but this increases to 15% when you have a highly risk precedent, risk uh, taking precedent, and the probability increases to uh, 9% when precedents are uh, uh, highly assertive. Um, the bars on the background, if you are uh, wondering what do they mean, that's the act actual data and distribution of uh, this variable among a uh, president. So the distribution of risk, propensity, and assertiveness. Um, this is the final table that I want to show you with results. So uh, I, uh, you can see on the table uh, on the top part, uh, I am including the, the three main organizations that measure democracy around the world. You have varieties of democracy, the Freedom House, and Polidified. In all these cases, um, overreaching presidents, uh, the level of democracy in these countries decrease when there's an overreaching president in power. By overreaching president, I mean one that attempted a constitutional power grab. So you can see uh, very uh, the first column that uh, shows the electoral uh, democracies taking from, from varieties of democracy. If you focus on overreacher, uh, overreacher presidents, democracy in these countries decreases by 5%. And among non-overreaching presidents, the level of democracy increases 2%. Um, the table uh, at the bottom shows you um, the statistical analysis using five different measures of democracy taken from varieties of democracy. And it shows that overreaching, uh, overreacher presidents tend to decrease the level of the electoral, liberal, and deliberative democracy. I, uh, there aren't uh, the results for participatory and egalitarian democracy are not statistically significant. But uh, as you can see, uh, the effect of overreaching presence on the level of democracy is pretty clear. So in conclusion, <clears throat> The individual differences of presidents explain their attempts to relax their term limits and increase their powers, complementing current is mainly institutional accounts. The institutional explanations of the power graphs receive partial statistical support. In particular, judicial independence is the institution that most consistently inhibits overreaching presidents. The leaders' overreaching behavior have tangible consequences. Several leaders overstayed in office, abused their power, and led authoritarian regressions. Sadly, that explains why they also gain historical prominence, because they stayed, some of them, even for decades. The universality of the theory proposed suggests that the hypothesis tested should work across regions. Now, this research makes a contribution to four research streams. One is to uh, uh, research on democracy. Um, constitutional power grabbers move the presidency toward authoritarianism. If you engage with the literature about democratic erosion, most of the explanations are centered on the uh, socioeconomic variables or institutional variables. But there's little examination of um, president, uh, the behavior of uh, leaders such as, oh, today you have numerous examples that we can discuss in the Q&A. Um, it also makes a contribution to the study of political elites. Most of the study of political elites is centered on groups. Uh, my study pushes that to, uh, uh, encourages the study at the national and subnational level of individual elite members. It also makes a contribution to research on institutions because powerful actors such as presidents can generate endogenous institutional change. And the literature about endogenous institutional change mostly centers uh, in groups of elites. Uh, but some of these elite members are extremely powerful. So I encourage, uh, I think this is this, there's an enormous opportunity to study the effect of these individual leaders. And finally, uh, uh, this study makes a contribution to a uh, presidency studies by integrating presidency-centered and president-oriented studies. Presidency-centered uh, uh, research centers on the institutions that uh, surround uh, uh, presidents. The, um, so the institu institutional environment within which presidents operate. And, president, and the, these uh, studies 
depersonalize the presidency and they tend to be quantitative. You have president-oriented studies, which tend to be qualitative. They focus a lot on presidents, but there's no dialogue between these two uh, streams of uh, research. My research is integrating these two streams by testing a president-oriented hypothesis using the quantitative format commonly used in presidency-centered studies. Thank you very much for listening, and I will be happy to uh, answer or address your questions. Well, Professor Rana, thank you so much for sharing your research and your expertise with us. I always enjoy this event every year, but I also think it's extra special when we have someone from our community share their knowledge. If you have a question and you're in the audience, feel free to pose that question in the Q&A function in Zoom. So one of the questions that we have for you this evening is about your research looks at state level systems of governance and people who spent their political lives cultivating their personas. Are there any parallels or lessons you would offer to people who want to stop the abuses of power grabbing leaders? Uh, that's a great question because uh, you don't only have a power grabber leaders at the presidency level, they are in different positions of power. So um, the institutional variable that mostly inhibits precedence is judicial independence. So judicial independence, when the judiciary is independent, uh, it insulates the constitution from uh, uh, overreaching uh, precedence they, because they keep them, they uh, 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 um, exercise checks on precedence. So if we make a parallel to uh, um, even the non-political world or, 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 or politics at the subnational level, um, I think that institutions are, institutions are key, institutions that are enforced and that keep leaders accountable. So um, we shouldn't even at the corporate le uh, level, we shouldn't rely on the goodwill of uh, individuals and that uh, you can um, um, reach a, a solution to a conflict just by discussing it, sometimes, unfortunately, there are um, abusive leaders. So in those cases, there need to be rules uh, on place that can uh, enforce, uh, be enforced uh, uh, to keep them accountable. So there should be mechanisms to, um, uh, that force leaders to be accountable uh, and uh, that should prevent uh, in, in the recurrence of abuses. Great. Have you seen that happen anywhere? Um, abuses or or mechanisms to uh, um, keep leaders accountable. The the latter, the mechanisms to keep. I have seen it, uh, and probably some uh, people in the audience uh, probably have seen abusive leaders. And unfortunately, what I have observed is that there's a a long gap, in my opinion. Uh, uh, so you see abuses uh, that last for a while until there's a a, a decision is made uh, to stop the abuses. Um, and if, if you think more broadly, uh, that's what the the all the Me Too movement uh, unveiled, right? That there were lots of uh, gender abuses and nothing happened, and uh, and the abuses were not penalized. I think that's changing and for the good. Um, but uh, and institutions uh, are for that. So this should not depend on the goodwill of individuals, uh, or, or, and it should depend on rules that are enforced. Great, thank you. So you touched on this a little bit in your presentation, but I'm curious about the measurement of personality traits. Can you tell us more about how you measured the president's dominance, risk-taking, and assertiveness? Sure. So let me uh, share my presentation again, because I have, um, let me see, and I have in the appendix, I have uh, the measurement of uh, the different uh, in individual differences. So for example, for dominance, I took this, I'm not a psychologist, and I have not I, I, the worst, uh, I mean, a big mistake that you can make as a political scientist is to come up with an idea and then also uh, out of the blue, create a measurement for a concept. 
it is much better to uh, take concepts that have been developed by scholars. So that's what I did. Uh, I took this uh, a questionnaire that measures dominance. So if you were an expert on a present, you would have to answer this questionnaire without knowing that you were answering a questionnaire about dominance. So uh, the experts who completed this uh, survey didn't know what they were addressing. Um, they knew that there, some of them were psychological characteristics, but not which questionnaire was asking what. So you can see here, uh, so this is the measurement of a dominance. I took it from Goldberg et al. Uh, and a, a, the risk, a, risk taking, I took it from the risk taking index. It has a 40, um, no, it has a, it asks, a, a, the present attitude I modified because this is not about presence, but I changed uh, the ask the, 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 the uh, these questionnaires are sometimes for other people, so it can be about your boss, but it can also be about yourself. So uh, I modify them uh, accordingly, and I ask something that is very important. I ask a expert to evaluate presence. Uh, before the risk taking, before they were in, in the presidency and during their time in office. Why? Because presidents have incentives. Let's say you have a risk taking individual becoming president, and that president, let's say, loves to smoke and to you know, drive fast and drink a lot. Well, you can do that as a politician, you can get away with that, but not in the presidency. So they tend to hide that uh, risky behavior. So, uh, and, I, and uh, my results show that uh, the measurement of risk taking for presidents during office is uh, lower. So I use as the true measurement of risk taking, the measurements applied to when presidents uh, were before, before reaching the presidency. And this uh, questionnaire measures uh, risk taking in six domains, recreational risks, health risks, career risks, financial safety, and social risks. So um, this is the, uh, the this gives you a score that is the average of all of these um, um, different components of risk taking. Um, and political inexperience, it's, a, uh, it's easier to measure. I also use different measurements of political inexperience. Uh, that is taken mostly from the literature in comparative politics. So at one extreme, you have highly experienced uh, uh, politicians, those who have uh, experience in the executive branch and in the legislative branch before reaching the presidency. On the other end, you have presidents that essentially enter, uh, became presidents only after running for office. Uh, so that is the case of uh, former President Donald Trump in the US, uh, but that is not uncommon in uh, Latin American countries. And in between you have presidents uh, who have uh, uh, only experience at the subnational level and others that were either uh, had executive experience or legislative experience, but not both. Great. So your presentation, uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, and this is the measurement for assertiveness. It's the same logic uh, applied for uh, that applied for dominance. It's taken from a well-established uh, questionnaire, and it's taking it's taken from the international personality item pool, which is has something that is very uh, that I appreciate it very much that uh, they share for free these scales, so you don't have to pay them a uh, copyrights for using them. Right. So your presentation focused on Latin America, but have you seen this phenomenon at play in other countries as well? Or are there other characteristics of the region that cultivate this style of leadership? Uh, that's a great question. And um, especially with term, the relaxation of term limits, you can see that that has happened. Uh, that is a global uh, phenomenon. Recently, uh, or recently in the last years, uh, uh, President Vladimir Putin of Russia removed uh, his term limits. Uh, Xi Jinping, um, um, uh, president of China, removed his term limits. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a particularly common phenomenon in sub-Saharan African countries. Um, mm -hmm. Although in the last years, uh, term limits have become more resilient in sub-Saharan uh, African countries. Um, uh, uh, this, my theory could 
perfectly well be tested for African leaders or, or, or presence from any other regions, really. So the, uh, that, that's one of the my goals is to uh, I use I focus on Latin American presidents, but this is a universal theory. Mm. Great. You have a book coming out next year. Have the recent elections and leadership, the return of De Silva in Brazil, for example, caused you to re-examine or revisit any of your book-related writing and research? Um, not, not, not really. Uh, not really. What is uh, I think what is fascinating, or, or that's something that uh, it's validating for my research. For example, is that the last attempt to relax term limits was in uh, 2021 by President Najib Bukele of El Salvador. So, uh, and it was a very blatant violation of uh, El Salvador's constitution. Uh, the constitution of El Salvador has four. Um, four clauses forbidding re-election. And Be uh, Bukele controls the legislature. It's a unicameral legislature. And this unicameral legislature, in which he enjoys an overwhelming majority, more than two thirds of it, they replace the members of the Supreme Court. And the new members of the Supreme Court said that those articles of the constitution that forbid re-election really don't apply. Uh, they 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 are outdated. So I mean that's a really childish argument to make. Is has no legal basis, but that has allowed that will allow uh, President Bukele to run for re-election next year. And if nothing drastically changes, he will very likely be re-elected because he is the most popular president in the Americas. His popularity is around 90%. And he has become also uh, internationally famous in the last uh, years for different reasons. Uh, this is the president who legalized a uh, Bitcoin uh, as a currency. Mm -hmm. So this next question was submitted uh, by an audience member and I, I find it very interesting. So you mentioned that the judicial branch often serves as a mechanism to force accountability upon the executive presidential branch of government. How do countries with judiciaries, which are appointed by the executive presidential branch, keep an appearance of independence as they act to check and balance? Well, uh, one thing that I would mention, and I appreciate this question because uh, judicial independence is key for keeping presidents accountable, but judicial independence is not isolated. Usually you have it in, it depends on the environment because the judiciary uh, does not have uh, two power, powerful um, sources. They cannot enforce their verdicts uh, and rulings. Uh, they need uh, enforcement agencies to do that and they don't control their budget. So they are very, they can be, um, uh, their independence can be curbed if the other branches of government attempt it. Having said that, uh, well, um, there are different mechanisms for, and I, I assume that the question alluded more to the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. so uh, which is a controversial uh, topic in the US. So how you can make them more independent? Well, uh, there are different rules of appointment. So for example, in my country, the current members of the Supreme Court justices, they um, offer five names to the president. So they pre-select five potential uh, uh, new justices and the president can choose one of them. So that gives more control to the current uh, Supreme Court. And the president chooses one of those five and then that needs to be ratified by the Senate just like in the United States. So that's a way of taking away a little bit the power of uh, the president because uh, I, uh, as you can see in the in the United States, if you have the Senate is controlled by the same party that controls the executive, well, you can, uh, the president can very well uh, appoint a, a justice based on the ideological record of that uh, justice. And there are different mechanisms. So in other countries, uh, you don't have a, 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 a lifetime tenure for Supreme Court justices. Also, the Supreme Courts 
in other places tend to be less powerful than the American Supreme Court, uh, which is, I, I, th I uh, think it's pretty unique, uh, the, the, the influence that the American Supreme Court uh, has. If you think about it, the same court can decide whether uh, the Constitution uh, uh, legalizes uh, abortion or uh, whether abortion is a constitutional right or it is not. Uh, so uh, usually so, uh, Supreme Courts don't have that power because the Constitution says clearly whether abortion is uh, forbidden or not. I think we have time for one more question. And, uh, you know, the last question kind of brought things back to the United States. And since this is Constitution Day, I am going to bring it back to the U.S. Uh, a little bit. But do you see any patterns in the policy or actions by current or former U.S. leadership that are similar to the personalities that you researched? Certainly, uh, certainly. Uh, I don't think that, that, and I have data for that, and I have compared like the personality traits of American presidents and Latin American presidents. Um, I don't remember the details, but they are not, uh, I mean, they overlap. They, they, I mean, they are not different. Uh, they seem to be cut by the same cloth. <laughs> so, uh, um, but, Something that the U.S. strongly has is judicial independence. So uh, uh, that uh, the, the the U.S. has a strong judicial independence, and the military is not political, so uh, obeys the uh, uh, the Constitution, not an individual. So um, presidents who want, for example, to overthrow their democracy, uh, they can, uh, so key actors are the military and the judiciary. If you control the judiciary, everything that you do becomes legal. There's a legal reasoning and support for whatever you decide because you have a subservient judiciary. And that can uh, numb the military in believing that, okay, we follow the laws and the judiciary is the one that interprets the, the, the laws. The other actor, clear act, uh, relevant actor is the military. And uh, so the military have been very involved in Latin American politics, unfortunately. They are, uh, they still in some countries are not under de facto civilian control. They are under the jury civilian control. Um, and that is a key, I think, a, in, in the United States. What I, th I think you cannot count with to defend democracy across countries, including the United States, is with the support of Congress, a Congress trying to stop an overreaching president. You do have that, but if the same overreaching president enjoy a majority of the legislature, as is currently the, uh, the situation in El Salvador and other countries, well, then you, the main um, um, institutions that can uh, protect democracy are the judiciary and uh, uh, the armed, armed forces. Well, Professor Rana, thank you again so much for sharing your uh, knowledge and expertise with us here this evening and taking the time to answer those great questions. My pleasure, and I agree with you, excellent questions. At this time, I would like to introduce Carnegie Mellon's Vice President for Student Affairs and Dean of Students, Gina Casalino. Lenny, thank you so much. And thank you especially to Dr. Arana for this really interesting lecture. Uh, and Lenny, thanks for facilitating such thoughtful questions posed by our audience. I wondered if we would get to that last question, and indeed we did. Um, it is really, it's so fascinating to examine the political context of other countries while we interrogate the landscape here in the US, both historic and present. Um, you've given us much to contemplate following your lecture, Dr. Arana. Thank you again so much. Um, for those here in Pittsburgh, I look forward to continued engagement with you as we launch Democracy Day this year, um, which will be held on Election Day, November 7th. Um, please stay tuned for updates on our scheduled activities that are designed to support civic service and engagement on key ideals of democracy. 
tonight's lecture has really given us um, an interesting lens through which we can examine our foundational democratic values here in the United States. As we wrap up tonight's program, I'd like to recognize the Carnegie Mellon departments who collaborate each year to bring this annual event to the community. Keith named them at the beginning. And I'll just share a little bit um, about each. The university libraries serve as a physical and spiritual home base to convene and deeply explore the intellectual issues of the day. Um, likewise, here in Student Affairs, we are committed to the holistic development of our students, including a lifelong commitment to intellectual curiosity. And our colleagues in the alumni and constituent engagement team welcome sharing opportunities with our alumni and friends of the university. So thank you to all of the staff and faculty from these three campus partners who have made tonight's program possible. Finally, I'd like to just say once again, thank you so much to Professor Arana for enlightening us with your research and to you, our audience, for joining this, joining us this evening. Have a good night, everybody.